Hey everybody, it's Professor Parrish. I hope you guys have had a great first week uh, back in classes and that you're getting everything sorted out, figuring out where your classes are, getting all of your online classes taken care of, and I hope that navigating this course in week one has been easy for you. So this video marks our very first lecture video. I am going to do a lecture video each week talking about the chapter chapter that we read or chapters that we read each week, talk about the assignments that are due, any housekeeping things, basically to keep you all up to date with what we're doing in the class. And since it's online, this kind of serves as my lecture for you all for the week. So <laughs> um, where these videos will be located, as I create this video, it will be featured in this announcement section. So I will post a blog that will link up to my YouTube channel, which is Professor Parrish, and you can get on there and see the videos at any time that you want. Um, even if for some reason, if we have any like technical issues with MySIC and you can't get online, you can always go to YouTube and those videos will be there for you. Um, keep in mind though, I do teach other classes, so this is English 122. Just make sure you select the 122 video for the week and you should be good. Um, I will also feature the video in the resources section of our page as well. So if I click on that, uh, it will be featured in, um, you can do this little drop down, it'll be in the link section for week two and every subsequent week afterwards. So that's where you can find the videos. Hopefully you have watched the introduction video, which is right here. You've read the syllabus. We've got a lot to go over this week, so I want to go ahead and jump right into it. All right, um, before we get started talking about the chapters and paper one guidelines, things like that, I do want to go over um, a few really quick things now that we are in the course. So I'm going to change my view to view this site as you all would view it. So if I go to, you have the options of weekly assignments or course content. To be honest, <laughs> I really wish that I had the option to get rid of weekly assignments. I don't like the structure of it, and I will show you why. Um, Course content and weekly assignments feature the exact same thing. They're just in different formats. Weekly assignments, if you look at it, it's very cluttered. There's all these boxes, there's the list of our assignments, and then there's extra. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot, and I don't like the way that it's structured. I would much rather go to course content, which features the exact same information, just as you can see in a much more streamlined package. So it will show you what is due in this box, and if you scroll down, just to double check, it will give you all the assignments as well. So for week one, you had grammar, the grammar sampler, and the week one discussion forum. The due dates are listed. Um, once you complete an assignment, I don't know if you've noticed this yet, but once you complete an assignment, there will be a check mark by it, and that due date will disappear. That means that that assignment has been turned in, it's been submitted, and it's being graded. So. If you don't see a check mark by your assignments each week, that means that it's not been turned in. So that is a good way for you to keep track of, oh, did I do that assignment or did I not? You can check and see and it will show up on there. Um, for week two, you'll notice that we have three assignments this week. Um, one is our discussion forum, like what we did last week, so that should be pretty familiar to you by now. Um, and then these other two are the thesis drop box and the reading response. Um, now if I click on the reading response, it's due uh, Sunday, January 20th. Um, you'll see that the only assignment is in our textbook. We have um, The Hills Like White Elephants, which is by Ernest Hemingway, which we'll talk about in week three. <laughs> um, it's on page 319 to 320 in our book. So your reading response is to read that story and then do questions one through five on page 319 in our textbook. Um, then what I would recommend doing is opening up a Word document or a notepad document, type out your answers. Um, if you do it through Google Docs, you do need to download that file to your computer as a Word document um, because sometimes students like to try to share Google Docs and they don't work. So needs to be a Word document or an RTF, which is re rich text format, and that's through like notepad, WordPad, things like that. Um, save it to your computer or on your phone, whatever. And then what you'll do is you'll click this Upload File button. Now, what our online course does is that when you upload files to any of your online classes, it will save that file into the system. 
which is kind of cool because that means that no matter where you are, you can always go back and access it. So for example, if I'm on a trip or on vacation and I need to post something or a student asks for a presentation and I need to email it to them, I can instantly do this choose file and I can actually pick the file out of what's saved to my online courses, which is pretty cool. It's kind of like a universal Google Drive. Um, as you can see, I've got several years worth of documents on here and you can organize them by date, size, file name, whatever. But you will want to, if you're uploading from your computer, you'll want to click the upload button, choose the file that you want, and then I'll just pick this file. Um, you can rename it. Um, once it says 100%, you can click insert. It will show you the documents there. You can rename it. You can add a description, whatever but click add file and then you'll notice that it's not submitted yet because they said if you're finished um, turn in your assignment so there is one extra step don't forget to do that but once I click this button it will show that it's turned in it says your homework's been turned in so you can no longer add or edit files if you accidentally turn in the wrong file it has happened before but if that happens, just email me and say, hey, I turned in the wrong file on accident. I didn't mean to click send, submit when I did. Can you reopen it? As long as it is before the due date, I can reopen it. Now, if you turn something in Sunday night at 11.55 and then Monday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you're like, oh, hey, can we redo that? No. But if you turn something in early and then, you know, it's the wrong file on accident, as long as you give me a heads up ahead of time, you should be fine. But I would encourage you, double check your files, make sure you're labeling them really good. I know some students have turned in things that are like document 57 or document 79. I don't know how you guys keep track of which document's which, but that would confuse me. So I would make sure that you give it a very specific name so that you know that you're turning in the right file. And then once you have, I'll show you if we go back to course content, it will show you that that assignment has been submitted. Voila. All right. Um, now, as far as our reading assignment goes, um, the directions on there, you've already got those. Um, our discussion forum's the same. The other assignment for this week is our paper one thesis. So I'll click on that. Um, I am going to go over the guidelines with you in this video, but for your thesis, what you will do is it's very, very simple. Uh, you will need to type out a, um, a few sentences where you explain what you're choosing to do for paper number one and kind of what your points are going to be about in that paper. Just giving me a general overview of what you're doing. Should just be a few brief sentences, nothing major. Um, if you have questions about paper one, you can include that in your thesis statement, but that's pretty much it. It should be a very easy assignment, um, but you'll upload it the exact same way as I just showed you, and that's how the Dropbox works. And you can always email me if you have questions about the Dropbox. So speaking of which, <laughs> we will go to resources. We've got two things to look at today. Um, one, if you've not looked at our syllabus from week one, please do so. This MLA citation presentation, our paper one doesn't really use MLA, um, depending on which option you choose, and I'll go over that in a moment but it's always here in week one. I like to put it at the very beginning so that it's the first thing you run into on the resource page. You don't have to dig around and find it. It's always right there. So when we go over MLA and citations, that will always be there for you to download. But we are gonna first look at paper one, our guidelines. All right, so paper one, our focus is on prose. This can be fiction or nonfiction. I, when I do papers, I like to give students a lot of options because I remember being in an, in, in an English class where our instructor chose what we wrote about and sometimes I liked it and sometimes it was the worst topic ever. Um, I'm not a Victorian literature fan. Uh, it's a lot of, you know, rich people and their problems. First world problems the novel series <laughs> and I just have never been a fan of it so I, I remember being in a class and my professor loved Victorian lit and made us write about it and I just struggled through writing it because I wasn't interested in it so I, w I couldn't be invested in my writing and I don't want you all to be in that same boat so even though our papers have themes like this first theme is prose 
I am going to give you several options and you can pick which one you feel most comfortable with and write about the topic you feel most comfortable with because I feel if you're writing about something that you're passionate about or at least are interested in then it won't be such a chore to write and you'll have more fun with it and it will lend itself to be a better paper. So for this paper you have some options. Um, we are going to be talking about these seven elements of fiction. So setting, character, plot, point of view, symbolism, theme, and style are all going to be talked about in our fiction unit, or prose unit rather. And so you actually have five options <laughs> for this paper to choose from. So options everywhere. Um, option one is a um, creative writing option. You can write a short fiction story if you'd like. I've had several students do this option. If you are creative and you want to be imaginative and create your own story, you can. Um, I've had students do like a crime noir drama. I've had students do science fiction, fantasy, dystopian, futuristic stories. I've had students do a lot of different types of this option. And if you like creative writing, this is your chance to kind of show it off. That's option one. Uh, option two is a creative nonfiction. A lot of times we see the word narrative thrown out with this, but I like creative nonfiction because it's not just a narrative. You are creating a story about something that's happened to yourself or someone that you know. So it is more of a narrative story, but that is an option if you want to do it. Uh, a memoir is kind of like creative nonfiction, except a memoir is very much like a diary. So whereas a creative nonfiction is usually in first or third person point of view, a memoir is only in first person and it reads like a diary. So I have actually had a student write a, um, a memoir about an event that happened in their life and each paragraph was like a diary entry. That's a memoir. So that is an option. The formatting is just its own thing. Uh, now fan fiction, if you don't know what fan fiction is, fan fiction is where you create a story based off something that already exists. And I've had a lot of students come up with some really fun fan fiction for this first paper. Um, you basically, the, the pro of fan fiction is that you're dealing with elements that already exist. So characters that are already in existence and scenarios, but you put your own spin on it. So for example, I, I'll give you two examples of fan fiction that I've had students do. Um, one, I've had a student retell the first chapter of Harry Potter only from Ron Weasley's point of view. So instead of focusing on Harry, it focused on Ron and his family dynamic and what happened as he was getting ready to go to Hogwarts. So I had a student write a paper about that. It was really fun. I really liked it. But it was basically characters we already know that exist. They were just giving a new spin on it. The other student paper that I had do fan fiction, which I really liked, was she did what's called a crossover where she took characters from two different stories and combined them. And this, this has been a little while ago, so when I tell you what she's crossed, you're going to be like, wow, that was a little while ago. Um, she took the characters of Grey's Anatomy and had them interact with the characters from the Hangover series. So Bradley Cooper's at Galifianakis, um, Ed Helms. Yeah, she basically had Meredith Grey, and um, I can't remember the blonde doctor. I'm not, I don't watch Grey's Anatomy, so she had to give a little author's note telling me who all the characters were. I, kn I knew who Meredith Grey was. But um, anyway, their characters go to Vegas, and they meet up with the characters from The Hangover, and hilarity ensues. It was really fun and creative, and it was neat to see these two things that you normally wouldn't associate with one another kind of interact and what happens from that. So you can do that if you'd like to do fan fiction. Um, I do ask that you put a little author's note at the beginning, which is a brief paragraph where you kind of explain the stories that you're talking about, because chances are I've not read or watched them, um, just on the off chance. And then finally, if creative writing is not your thing, <laughs> if you don't want to write about yourself, you don't want to do a story, a fan fiction, creative short story, whatever, if you're like, ah, mm -mm, you do have the option to analyze a piece of prose, meaning you take a story that's already in existence and you basically analyze it. How does it use all of the elements of fiction? How does it use elements of literature? You basically just analyze it like a normal essay. 
Um, my only thing with that is if you choose to do it, you have to talk about all of the elements, not just this one. <laughs> this is what we call a book report, <laughs> and I hate them <laughs> because I, I get really frustrated because a lot of students will choose to do this last option because they think it's going to be easier. Not true. It's each of these options can be as easy as you make it, and it can be as hard as you make it. So, um, but I have a lot of students choose the analysis part, and they only talk about the plot. And it ruins the story for me, because honestly, I will be honest with you, I am ruined on the Hunger Games because of this class. I just am. I read the first book, I watched the first movie when it came out, and around that time I had several students decide they would write about the Hunger Games series for their paper choosing this option. The problem is they basically spoiled the second and third book for me. They told me the whole plot of both and when I got done I was frustrated because I thought oh well now I don't have to see the movies or read the books because I know what's gonna happen. <laughs> so I get very frustrated with that and I have had some students be really respectful and um, I had a student talk about um, a book series that they didn't spoil the ending to and I was very glad that they didn't um, but if you choose this last option please note that you are responsible for talking about all seven elements equally not just focusing on one or the other alright so those are your options for paper one now as far as formatting goes um, page length three full pages it can be longer than that but at least three full pages and not two pages and a couple lines on the third page no three solid pages of text um, and if you choose to go longer most students end up going longer that's perfectly fine um, now if you get to 20 pages I'll cut you off but you can go more than three and it won't affect your grade um, 12 point font this font is actually 11 point so make sure when you open up a word document you check the font size here and um, no bold cursive or large fonts <laughs> believe it or not my fellow students I was in college too <laughs> and I know all of the tricks of the trade because I've maybe I didn't do them all but I've had friends that have and I know that some of you will be tempted to look on here and go what's the biggest font I can find <laughs> And some of you will decide, maybe this one. No. <laughs> or you'll get on here and say, Charlemagne, that sounds legit. Look how much bigger that is. Look at that. No. No, no, no. We're going to go back to Arial. Now, you can get creative. Um, I'm not saying choose a boring font. You could do like Cambria. Perfectly fine. Or Georgia or New York Times, um, New Roman, Times New Roman, or Arial. But... If you pick a giant font, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to get your paper, I'm going to downsize it to the appropriate size, and then I'm going to grade you based on that. So I know you'll try to pull the wool over my eyes. I hope you don't. But some students are like, ah, she won't suspect. I will. <laughs> I've been teaching this class long enough. Um, make sure that there are one-inch margins and double-spaced. Um, double-spaced, if you're not sure how to do that, you can go, like right here, I can highlight this you can go down to line spacing options and you can see here pick double um, no nope, double All right that's what double looks like so see three pages double spaced not hard at all um backtrack here now one inch margins let me zoom out a little bit as you can see here um, pretty much this is already set at one inch margins the layout Everything's already set normal, one inch margins on all sides. And pretty much any Word document you open up will be one inch margins when you open it. Um, the only reason I say this is because I have had some students, again, trying to be clever, that were like, oh, I'll just change the margins to like three. Yeah, they try to make it to where the paper is so condensed that their, their paper is like, starts here and ends here and it's just like one little column of text don't do that you all know better so uh, spelling and grammar is what I look at 
Um, there is no work cited citations that are needed for this paper. The only exception is if you have any outside research mentioned in your paper or if you use any images then you need to cite them but otherwise you should not have to use MLA for this first paper and then everything needs to be due on time so your thesis should be in the Dropbox by Sunday January 20th your outline which we'll talk about next week should be in the Dropbox by January 27th your final draft is due Sunday February 10th so I give a bit more time on this paper than I do normally our other papers because this is our first paper to kind of get in the groove figure out the writing options everything like that so if you have questions my email is there and then the paper is broken down as you can see on the second page so grammar and spelling the page length and formatting are worth 30 points altogether and the rest is how you describe the elements in place so as you can see if you only describe plot you're missing out on 50 points which that's half of the paper so this first paper should be fairly easy um, I think students consider this one of their more favorite papers of the class because you have so many options but as you write this paper if you have questions just let me know all right now <laughs> get into the second part of our video today which is talking about chapters one through four in our book and I'm gonna make this I've got a cup of coffee we're not gonna dwell all day on this we're gonna jump right in and have some fun with this all right, so fiction presentation, chapters one through four. I'm going to open this sucker up. All right, so in your textbook, before we start, um, the promise of literature starts on our actual page one in our Discovering Literature textbook. And I know that you have um, six pages to look at in your Cengage handbook. I'm not going to go over those today. They're pretty cut and dry. If you used your Cengage handbook for English 121 last semester, you'll probably be familiar with it. So if not, just skim over pages 10 through 16 in your Cengage handbook and you'll be fine there. Uh, now, I'm going to pull up uh, part one. Yes. And let's uh, get this thing going. All right. So chapters one through four in our Discovering Literature textbook. Um, before I get to it, if you look on pages 1 through um, 11 or 12, 1 through, well, actually goes on a lot more than that, but um, 1 through 12 to 13 in our book talks about the promise of literature and just the whole point of it and that it's really about telling stories, about expressing ourselves, about expanding beyond just the normal to delve into themes about life in general, about obstacles we face, about our moods, about our passions. Literature does so much and it can be used in such a variety of ways. A lot of times people write prose or write poetry as therapy. I mean, it's therapeutic. You get all your emotions, your thoughts out there. I mean, there's a big demand for literature. We have stores that sell books and pawn books. I mean, for a reason. We have libraries for a reason because people crave to read whether or not we all read the same genre that's the beauty of it we all like different things for different reasons but every story every fictional story has the same essential parts to be good and that's what we're going to talk about today all right i'm going to move this up here uh oh yeah here let me move my little thing up here before i go back okay so chapter one deals with the preview of prose and how to interact with it so when our chapter one starts actually starts on page 56 and you'll notice this as we go through our textbook that I cover a lot of chapters at once but most of this textbook are example stories you will find as we go through this semester that the very beginning and throughout the chapters there are bits and pieces of key concepts that we need to go over but the majority of this text are just example stories to back up what we learn which I really like I enjoy that this textbook has so many examples because I feel it gives each of us a chance to pick out examples that we identify most with and use those to learn the concepts that we're going to talk about so I appreciate that um, <laughs> so if you're wondering are we gonna read every page in this book no <laughs> we're just gonna go over the key concepts so on page 56 they talk about what we use or I'm sorry not page 56 what am I doing let's go back to the preview chapter 26 
<laughs> talking about how we need to interact with pros. The main thing is keep an open mind. There's going to be a lot of things that you read that may be outside of your comfort zone that you may not be familiar with. And the best thing to do is just kind of go in with a blank slate and let your opinions form as you read. Um, number two on here I think is the hardest out of all of them, and that's reading more than once. Because we live in such a fast-paced world that reading a story more than once oftentimes doesn't happen. It just doesn't. So it may be hard to read a story more than once, but if you have the time and the chance, it's definitely recommended because it's kind of like watching a movie a second time. The first time that you see Inception, for example, you may be like, wait, what happened? And then the second time you go back and you start to pick out things you didn't notice before. And the same thing applies with literature. The first time you read a story, it's very raw and organic. And then you go back and read it again, you're like, oh, well, I should have seen this plot, this twist coming because here's this point and that point. And things become more understood and more to your attention the second time you go over them. And that ties in with using your imagination. You have to allow your brain to kind of go outside itself and use your imagination to visualize scenes, to visualize characters. A lot of times we become so angry at movie adaptations because how we view the character is not how it's translated to film, and that's frustrating for people. I know I use um, The Great Gatsby as an example. I had a lot of friends in college that when Boz Lerman's Great Gatsby movie came out, they wouldn't go see it because they're like, Leonardo DiCaprio, he is not Gatsby, and blah, blah, blah. And um, I honestly didn't have a problem with the movie. I liked it, but uh, a lot of my English friends were like, no, but we'll not see it. It's not the same. So, you know, people get invested in stories, and so sometimes it's hard when you see an adaptation it's not to your liking. Um, allow your emotions to come into play. That ties into that as well. As well. Let your emotions kind of dictate, you know, why do I feel this way about the story? What does that say about me as a person? Um, get the sense of a story as a whole. Think about your reactions and talk with others. And that is the beauty of this class. You may not have time for a book club, but here we are. <laughs> we're going to have our English 122 Literature Club, and we're going to talk each week about stories, about our reactions to them, and how we interact with that literature. So strap in. It's going to be a fun ride. There are seven elements of fiction. What are they? And I know my little box here kind of cuts off this one here, so I'll read them out. Um, our setting, where are we, and also when are we? I think time is an important setting as well. Um, oftentimes we think that setting is just where the story takes place, but when is also very crucial to understanding the character's motivations, their means, how actions happen. It's very important. Characters, every story has to have a character at least. Now, the character is just who. Characters can be human, they can be non-human, they can be nature, animals, inanimate objects if you're watching The Brave Little Toaster. They can be a manner of things. And then the plot is what happens to them. Um, point of view, who is telling the story and from what perspective. Symbolism, does the story or anything in it have extra meaning beyond itself? The theme, what does the story, what's its purpose? What does it make you think? And then finally, how does the author use language in the story? And that is the style. All of these elements are present in stories. How well they are accomplished and done depends on how well the story is. So, or vice versa, how well the story is depends on how well these elements are used. All right, um, setting and character. If we go um, over an overview of these different elements, uh, narrator is the person that tells the story, and we will go over the various types of narrators when we get to the points of view chapter. Um, dialogue is an exchange between characters. Um, <laughs> I was in a creative writing a creative writing class in college, and our professor, she told us that the best way to write believable dialogue is actually to go somewhere in public, like a coffee shop or a restaurant or a movie theater, somewhere where you can sit down and, and kind of people watch or listen and write down their conversations. And that sounds really creepy because we had an assignment in that class where we had to go to our local coffee shop on campus and we had to write down a conversation. And it was kind of weird because you're eavesdropping on somebody and you're writing down what they're saying, 
But when you got done with that, you really got a sense of how organic conversation was. And people don't just go up to each other and go, Hello, how are you? My name is Rachel, and it is a glorious day outside. No, we use conjunctions and contractions. We say, like, it's great, or how are you doing? Fine, you? Fine. Like, our conversation can be short and choppy and not grammatically correct, and that's fine because it's dialogue. It's supposed to sound organic. Um, a lot of people have criticized Stephen King, for example, because Stephen King does write dialogue in a very formal rigid fashion and a lot of people when they try to adapt their film write his adapt his books to film they're like people don't really talk like that so i mean if you're gonna write good dialogue you need to write it like people actually speak it unless you know they're a robot or something and then that's what they're supposed to sound like yeah. so anyway our book discusses dialogue and i've got a sample of it here listed and i know that you can't quite see it very well because this is in the way but my point of writing out this dialogue is you can see that we use quotation marks, your comma is always um, before the next part, and that your punctuation, I know you can't see it, but your punctuation is always right before the quotation mark at the end. All right, And you can check out the actual slideshow in our resources to see this in action. Suspense, we have to hold the reader's attention throughout the story. Um, point of view on page 37, I really like the phrase, it is through whose eyes are we looking at the world. So it's really discussing how we look at um, the story based on our narrator. There are three types of point of view, which you are probably familiar with. First person is where it's I do things or this happened to me. It's all about you yourself. Um, second person is that you do things. And finally, third person is like he or she or Jane, or it's kind of like you're a fly on the wall looking in. Um, first and third are fairly common. Second person point of view is very difficult to write. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to write in second person point of view. It's weird and it's hard. Um, the reason for that is because it's almost like the reader is the character in the story. And a lot of times readers don't want that. <laughs> they don't want to be the character. They just want to read about stuff happening to other people, not themselves. Chuck Palahniuk, who writes um, Fight Club, who wrote the book Fight Club that was adapted into a really good movie, he writes a lot of times in second person, and it's weird, and it's scary, and that's the point. He is a horror, suspense, drama writer, and for him, second person point of view really gets that uncomfortable, settled feeling in you as you read, and that's what he's going for. But for the most part, we read stories either in first person or third. A symbolism what things have meanings beyond themselves. So colors, names, mythology, things that have extra meaning, that is symbolic. And a lot of good stories have rich symbolism throughout to make them interesting. I mean, we have a lot of shows that have like theory videos and people are like have crack theories about things. And a lot of it has to do with the symbolism that these characters have or that we see interact in the story or episode. Theme, what is the meaning of the story as a whole? The theme of a story can be as simple or as complex as you want to make it. Uh, texture is a nice kind of thing that has to do with theme. Texture is all about different details to, that come together to make a story really have a rich quality. And I like that our book describes it as sort of a web of revealing details or significant dialogue, things that make the interactions more compelling throughout a story. And then our book continues on with that with first impression versus running commentary. And the difference between these two, let's see if I can pick it up on here. Uh, the difference between them, if you go to page 50, page 50 of our textbook has first impression versus running commentary. Um, first impression is exactly what it sounds like. It's when you read a story for the first time, what do you think by the end of it? Um, I've done reviews for movies before, and TV shows before and I put them like on Tumblr and stuff just because I like writing and I like expressing my opinions <laughs> about movies and shows and I've done both of these. If I do a first impression analysis I will watch the entire movie or the entire episode of a show in its entirety and then sit down and write. And the benefit of that is is that I get to soak everything in organically and then write about my reaction. The bad thing is sometimes you forget things. 
like if you're watching a, an episode of a TV show and then you go back and you're like, okay, what happened then? You might have to go back and rewatch something. Whereas a running commentary, you actually make notes and observations as you read the story. So it is a much more organic kind of raw in the moment reaction. Um, the downside of that is sometimes you can be writing and then you aren't paying attention to the story so you might miss something there. So there's kind of pros and cons to it, but as you write your responses to some of the things that we will watch in this class, you can do either a first impression or a running commentary, whichever you decide that you like better. So just keep this in the back of your head because we will come back to this uh, later on in the semester. Now, brainstorming, you've probably done this in high school. Our textbook talks a little bit about brainstorming. A brainstorming is not my favorite <laughs> chapter or discussion to talk about because everyone does it so differently. But our textbook offers on pages 52 through 54 a variety of different types of brainstorming that you can do. So um, clustering, for example, you have like the little, looks like the Blair Witch Project, the little collection of bubbles there on page 53 that you can look at. And that's all right. I'm personally a lister. I like listing things in order and that works for me. So the nice thing about brainstorming is you have a lot of options and the main idea of it is that, that you are thinking ahead of what you're going to write ahead of time. So you do have some kind of in the works thinking about what you're about to write. You don't, you don't just sit down and go, okay, three hours, I'm going to check out a paper because that often doesn't work. <laughs> Usually you have to think about it ahead of time and kind of get some ideas going before you sit down and type it out. Um, a capsule portrait is a nice exercise if you're going to be doing some of our creative writing options for paper one. So if you're doing option one, for example, and you're creating a character for a short story that you're going to make up out of nowhere, a capsule portrait might be nice. It's where you can talk about the character of your story, you can map out their likes, dislikes, you develop a personality, their appearance, their philosophy. Creating these characters will help make them easier to write in your story. And um, our Cengage Handbook, that still says Wadsworth, but our Cengage Handbook actually has more information on brainstorming as well. So it's a little typo on my part. But all right, chapter two in our textbook focuses on setting. I'll get to this here. Uh, chapter two, there are four types of setting. And I would keep note of these because you will notice on our uh, chapter exam, our exam on fiction, I will list and ask you what these four types of settings are. So you might want to keep that in mind. Uh, the four types of setting are mirror, mold, escape, and alien. Um, now mirror setting is where the setting reflects a prevailing mood in the story. So for example, if your story takes place in a desert, you, the feeling might be of hopelessness, of despair, um, with a mold setting, it shapes characters. So like your example there, orange is the new black. The characters in, those sh in that show are stuck in a prison for the most part, and that prison begins to shape their mood, their reactions, their reactions and actions to things going on in the story. It very much molds who they are. That's what a mold setting is. Um, escape setting is where it goes to an imaginary or dreamlike place, so Alice in Wonderland. Perfect, perfect example of an escape setting. Um, sometimes stories go to like exotic places like vacation resorts or the beach or somewhere unusual for that character and that's kind of an escape for them to get out of their comfort zone and into this new exotic place. And then finally you have alien setting which represents the loss of home or the unknown. And an alien setting doesn't mean it has to take place in outer space. It can very much be like someone that's exiled from their home and sent somewhere and they don't know what to expect. That could be an alien setting. It just kind of depends on the story. There are two types of terms that relate to dialogue in this chapter. Um, one is stream of consciousness and that's where the story kind of meanders without any organization, sort of like a dream. It's not a very common term that we see with stories but it can happen. Um, and then interior monologue, we actually will talk more about this when we get to our fiction chapter. Or not fiction, to our drama chapter. But for right now, um, interior monologue is basically the stories taking place in the character's mind. 
So it's not really happening. It's all just in their head. And like I said, when we get to drama, we're ta we'll talk more about interior monologue because it's acted out on stage. It's a little bit different. But for now, those terms kind of just apply to our setting chapter. As you can see, uh, we're already on chapter three. And so I'm basically going to be going over the terminologies with these chapters and some key concepts. So if you were looking originally at this uh, video link and going, man, they're going over a lot of material. We are, but as I've said, most of our examples are just stories that we see in our book. Uh, chapter three, which talks about character, um, begins on page 90. And we are introduced to our main types of characters here. Um, the first are round versus flat characters. Round characters are what we hope that our main characters are. They're 3D, they're complex, they have personalities, motivation, depth. They have, you know, aspirations, and we understand why they do the things that they do. We kind of become connected to these characters. Flat characters are exactly that. They are two-dimensional. They're just one note. Very general background characters. They are not important to the story like a round character is. An initiation is a rite of passage that a character takes to get from one story to the next. Usually they pass a challenge or a trial to gain a character's trust or to become ready to take the next step of the journey in the story. Uh, personas we will talk about. This is a hidden personality or a mask, whether it's figurative or literal, that a character wears throughout a story and then finally they take it off and reveal who they actually are. So a lot of times in stories the villain that we come to find out has a persona throughout the film maybe thinking that we believe they're a good guy or in the book we might think this character is really good and in the end they turn out to not be good and that's sort of the persona we find out about. And then minimalist are when we have very simple characters who only have essential traits for the story. So when we read Hills Like White Elephants by Hemingway, which we'll talk about, uh, we will understand what minimalist means because Hills Like White Elephants is a very deep, deep story with very minimalist characters. So as you're reading that for our reading response one, keep that in mind because you'll understand what minimalist is by the time you're done with that um, passage. All right, so chapter four, the plot. Exposition is a huge part of plot. And what exposition means is whenever you start reading a story, we as the reader are not privy to information about the world that the story takes place in. So at some point in time, usually the main character will encounter someone that will give exposition or give important plot details that will come into play later on in the story. Now, a good story will execute exposition very creatively, interestingly, and effectively. And a bad story will just dump it on you in like a big pile and you have to sift through it. And that's not fun. So what I have done is I've gone out and found what I believe is a very good example of exposition. And you may have seen this movie before, possibly, but we're going to watch this really quick and then I'm going to um, kind of review how this is good exposition. All right? No. You, Sparrow. Hey, you were familiar with that ship, the Black Pearl? I've heard of it. Where does it make birth? Where does it make birth? Have you not heard the story? Captain Barbosa and his crew of miscreants sail from the dreaded Ila de Muerta. It's an island that cannot be found except by those who already know where it is. The ship's real enough. Therefore its anchorage must be a real place. Where is it? Why ask me? Because you're a pirate. And you want to turn by yourself, is that it? Never. They took Miss Swan. Oh, so it is that you found a girl. I see. Well, if you're intending to brave all hasten to a rescue and so win fair lady's heart, you'll have to do her like me. I see no profit in it for me. I can get you out of here. How's that? The keys run off. I help build these cells. These are half pin barrel hinges. 
with the right leverage and the proper application of strength, the door will lift free. What's your name? Will Turner. That would be short for William, I imagine. Good strong name. No doubt name for your father, eh? Yes. Uh, Will, Mr. Turner? I've changed my mind. If you spring me from this cell, I swear on pain of death, I shall take you to the Black Bow and your bonny lass to be on the court. Agreed. Agreed. Get me out. Hurry. Someone would have heard that. Not without my effect. Okay, so, I know that was a long video, but the point of that is, let me uh, lower the volume down here, is I absolutely love this as an example of exposition because we get everything that we need to know in this very short time. So, for one, we learn about the Black Pearl, we learn about the ship, we learn about the curse that is involved with the ship, just a little bit, just a little tease, we learn about where it makes birth, where it sails, we learn about basically what Jack's motivations are, that he needs to get out, he knows about this ship, he knows about the treasury, clearly has an interest in it, and we also learn about Will Turner's character and his motivations. He's doing this all for the girl he loves, he does not like pirates, he has a very strict moral code, he has skill sets, he knows how to build things and access things, and we also get some hints at things that are later to come. So if you've not seen Pirates of the Caribbean, I'm sorry I'm going to spoil a little bit of it, but we get hints at Will's name, how Jack clearly knows Will's dad from somewhere before, because why would he bring it up otherwise? Um, and Will catches on to that, you can tell by his facial expressions, that there's a connection between the two. And at the very end of this, we find out that Jack won't leave without his effects, which we come to find out the gun he has, he has committed himself to shoot Barbosa, and he's saving his one bullet for that. And that comes up later on. So we get all of this set up in this one little scene. And the dialogue back and forth is engaging enough where we're paying attention, but it doesn't feel like someone's dumping a whole ton of information on us at once. It feels very organic, very natural. It's just a good scene of exposition. And if you had looked at this on paper in a book, I think it would read out very conversational, very easy to follow, but it sets up so much, and I just really like it. So, yeah, good example of exposition. On page 136, I know that we jump around a lot in this book, but you can see that we talk about um, our types of characters that are affected through the plot. So, protagonist and antagonist. I will ask you all a question on our first exam. And most of the students will get this question wrong. Last semester was the very first semester that everyone got it right, so I'm hoping this semester follows suit. I will ask you, the protagonist and antagonist, is it good guy versus bad guy? Is it main character versus opposing character? A lot of times students will think that protagonist means the good guy, and it doesn't. It just means the main character. You have a story like Megamind or Venom, your characters are not necessarily good people, but they are the main characters. Your antagonist is simply the character that is keeping that protagonist from accomplishing their goal. Antagonists do not have to be human. They can be animal, they can be nature, they can be a physical force, um, they can be something mental or spiritual. They are just whatever is in the protagonist's way, the main character and the character that is trying to prevent them from accomplishing their goal. That is protagonist and antagonist. So keep a mental uh, bookmark right there on those terms. External conflict is pretty self-explanatory. It just means ac actions happening within the world of the story, the physical world, whereas internal conflict is something that's inside the character is dealing with. Uh, two types of narratives are listed in this chapter. We have loose narrative versus tight narrative. Um, loose narrative are where the events really don't have a clear structure and kind of meander. There's not really any set timeline that it follows. It can just kind of go from point to point. Um, I like to think that Alice in Wonderland, Doctor Who, 
shows that kind of just go all over the place, those kind of have a loose narrative. Whereas a tight narrative is very much cause to effect in a linear, straightforward order. There's no flashbacks. There's no going in and out of time. It's all point A to point B. Um, and that's kind of, they're two very different types of stories, but we see them a lot. Sometimes you see a loose narrative. Sometimes you see a very tight, structured story. And then flashbacks are just chronological breaks where we get to see a character's past. And these can happen any time in the story, just at the author's discretion. I include this little chart in here um, because I think it's very helpful to understand how plot usually goes in a story. Um, we have our setup, the very start. Um, we have our, you can't see it, there's a little arrow right here in the actual presentation if you download it, but we have our inciting incident, and that is the incident that sets the plot in motion. So, for example, what you don't want in a story is a plot that goes in a straight line. That's boring. So, I could have a story where Rachel goes to the mailbox and gets the mail and walks back to her house. That's boring. But, if Rachel is going to the mailbox and all of a sudden a car flies past her and is followed by three police cars, that's an inciting incident. Something out of the ordinary has happened. So Rachel turns from her mailbox and follows the cop cars down the road only to find out that the car has like flung itself into the park next door. And then the cops end up finding the person and arresting them. It's not the best plot, but it's something different. There's a rising action. The climax is the very height of the story, and then your falling action leads to your resolution. Now, I will say, most of the time, your falling action goes to maybe about here, and then there's the resolution. This is like Lord of the Rings Return of the King falling action, where it seems like there's four or five endings to the story, and you're like, this is taking forever to end. Um, that's kind of like this here. But usually your falling action is much shorter and then you have your resolution. All right, but this is a nice chart to kind of understand how the plot in a story should, for the most part, go. All right. And that's pretty much it. Uh, <laughs> keeping this video under an hour. Ah! Um, I will say that our lecture videos each week will not be this long. Um, since I was going over the paper one guidelines and all this other housekeeping things, it was a longer video than I intended. Um, I have had students before be like, oh, it's so long. Um, you can break this video up if you want. You can watch it in segments. Um, but yeah, that's chapters one through four. As you can tell, most of our chapters deal with just terminology, with key concepts, and I will be going over them, bringing in some outside sources, and spending time on those. So if you've not looked at those chapters, please do. Please make sure that you get the reading response. Uh, the discussion forum, and if you have questions about uh, paper one, please let me know because I'm always willing to help out um, if you have any questions or if you're stuck, if you're not sure which topic to go with, um, I would say for this paper one thesis, if you're stuck between two topics, write out both of them. And my best piece of advice would be write out which both topics and see which one you enjoy writing about more or which one comes to you more naturally and go with that one. All right. But if you all have any questions, let me know. Uh, next week, I'll come back with a vengeance for week three. <laughs> and hopefully it will not be as long as this video. But I hope that that helped. I hope you've enjoyed it. And as always, if you have questions, you can email me and let me know. But in the meantime, have fun with chapters one through four. Have fun looking and deciding what you want to do for paper one. And I look forward to reading your work and seeing you guys next week.